And good evening. Welcome to the New School. My name is Karen Kooni. I'm the director of the Verilis Center for Art and Politics and delighted to welcome you to this talk tonight or conversation, Who Builds Your Architecture? It's not a coincidence that this panel comes on the heels of May Day as we focus on the relationship between architecture and workers the panel poses core questions for the creative community, for our community. What is our responsibility towards the environment in which we work? What is the extent of our accountability as artists, culture workers, architects, but also as building occupants? Are there circumstances when art is not an absolute given, when what has been labeled creative restrictions, a common euphemism for labor rights, might actually be a valid criteria. Tonight, we're looking at architecture, but the questions pertain to all creative fields, as we increasingly work internationally in non-familiar contexts, all the while pronouncing ever deeper commitments to social responsibility and social justice. Before we hear from our extraordinary panelists, I want to acknowledge three formidable forces in the art and architectural community. They are artist Mabel Wilson, architect Kandambra Bangsi, and curator Beth Stryker, who conceptualized and helped organize this panel. They were also the ones who suggested our moderator for tonight, Reinhold Martin, the director of the Buell Center at the Graduate School for Architecture, Planning and Preservation at Columbia University, who will be joined by the panelists Peggy Diemer, Fred Levra, Andrew Ross, and Bill van Esveld. I thank them all very much for joining us tonight. Who Builds Your Architecture is the final event in the first year of a two-year-long investigation on thingness or matter here at the Verilis Center. It was launched last September with Jane Bennett's lecture on vibrant matter, continued with A.L. Weitzman's conference on forensic aesthetics, and will resume in the fall with a day-long symposium on Alexander Rojenko's notion of the object as a comrade. I'm convinced that what things do and what buildings tell us about their designers, but also the workers that built them, will be recognized as ever more important. In time, we will have to become more literal, literate in the languages of our material environment so that we may develop more advanced understandings of living ethically. And with that, I'm very pleased to introduce Mabel Wilson, who will now frame the discussion in more specific terms. Mabel, there you are. Hi. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Karen, um, for that wonderful um, introduction to the themes, some of the themes of the, of the panel. Um, and I just wanted to say a few words um, about um, maybe how we can begin to think, think about um, some ideas for, for our discussion. Um, several years ago, we were all disconcerted to learn that our fashionable Nike footwear had been assembled by women, many of them teenagers, laboring in untenable conditions in Indonesian, Taiwanese, and Chinese sweatshops. The uproar heard from student-led groups allied with workers' rights organizations and labor unions that promoted sweat-free labor leveraged across-the-board changes in the manufacture of consumer goods. Only a few months ago, we discovered that our sensuous Cupertino-designed eye products had their own nefarious links to coercive labor practices abroad. Many of us expressed unease, indignation, wrote letters, and signed petitions aghast at the treatment of the legions of workers employed by the multinational electronic behemoth Foxconn. Indeed, these instances clearly indicate how much of what we use comes to us via conduits of global capital that are underwritten by neoliberal economic policies and facilitated by the physical spaces and pathways channeling the movement of raw materials, finished goods, resources, waste, workers, managers, investors to all corners of the globe. But what does this have to do with architecture and what architects build? One might argue that buildings are static, and there's literally that course of statics in, <laughs> in structures, um, literally moored in place by their weighty foundations. But buildings are also tethered to and made through these same global flows. 
One particularly egregious confluence of these forces has resulted in the exploitation and abuse of migrant construction workers on Abu Dhabi's Sadiat Island, where the parametrically configured volumes of the Neu Louvre and Guggenheim Museums and NYU's state-of-the-art green campus will soon sprout from the desert sands. Tonight's panel of architects, activists, scholars, and educators tackles this difficult and pressing question, who builds your architecture? My collaborators in this endeavor, Kadambari Bakshi and Beth Stryker, titled the program in the form of a question in order to jumpstart amongst jumpstart a discussion amongst our colleagues. This ongoing debate about the ethics of building buildings begun by artists, scholars, and activists, such as those of the Gulf Labor Coalition, and in the reports issued by Human Rights Watch, is a conversation in which the voice of the architect should be heard. We're not seeking definitive answers tonight, but we hope that the dialogue amongst the panel and with you can clarify and identify future areas of discussion and action on this urgent topic of construction practices abroad and social justice. Now, before I turn the microphone over to our moderator, Reinhold Martin, we would like to convey our sincere gratitude to Karen Kuoni, director of the Vera List Center, for all her uh, generosity and guidance in bringing this conversation into fruition. Her probing and insightful suggestions on this topic have greatly enriched the content of this evening's program. We'd also like to thank Karen's crack team, Annie Shaw, yay, in the back, and the New School staff for directing the logistics to stage tonight's event. Now, we are free, extremely fortunate to have as our moderator one of the most provocative thinkers and writers in architecture, politics, and cultural theory today, Reinhold, Martner, Ang, uh, Reinhold Martin, Martin, the associate professor at uh, Columbia's GSAP. Among his many, many, many activities, which includes Columbia University's Committee on Global Thought and founding co-editor of the journal Grey Room, Reinhold also finds time to direct the PhD program in architectural history and the Temple Hoyne Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture. It is as the director of the Buell Center that he spearheaded the extraordinary document, the Buell Hypothesis, which became the basis for the current exhibition on view at MoMA, foreclosed, Rehousing the American Dream, co-organized with Barry Bergdahl. Reinhold has published numerous articles and essays, and his books include The Organizational Complex, Utopia's Ghost, and The Multinational City with Kadambari Bakshi. I'll now turn the podium over to Reinhold, who will introduce our panelists and open tonight's conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Mabel. Um, nice to see everyone here. And, uh, and thanks to all of the above for, uh, for getting us going on this uh, urgent subject. I, I was saying actually before um, we started that, that you know, even you know, with the simple kind of publicity associate, associated with this, um, this event, when one's name is you know, kind of listed, I've gotten emails like, oh, this is really interesting. I'm sorry I can't come, but it sounds great. And, and that doesn't happen all the time. So it really is to the credit of the organizers, because I am just the MC uh, here, but um, the or to the credit of the, of the organizers for, um, for you know, hitting uh, several nerves, I believe, uh, which uh, some of which I think may actually uh, become evident uh, during the actual discussion. Um, it's also, uh, before introducing everybody, I, I, I did also want to say that, you know, from the point of view of the many perspectives in which uh, one could place this question, I, I particularly appreciate uh, the literalness of, uh, of the approach. I mean, it's a kind of axiom that one uh, can, uh, in, a, in a sense, um, benefit from uh, in thinking about, for example, uh, the many entanglements of aesthetics and politics, which is to say, to be you know, first and foremost, as literal as possible uh, when thinking uh, that. And, and so, um, you know, and one of the funny things is when one does this with, with, with buildings and, uh, and, and, you know, sort of asks, okay, what historical precedent or any, you know, what conversation are in, in some sense we renewing or picking up in, in architectural history uh, here, um, one doesn't find many threads, um, it, particularly in the 20th century, perhaps, uh, the, the, the ones that come to mind most are, are the, the sort of anti-capitalist 
uh, arts and crafts kind of discussions in the late 19th century uh, about labor and making and, and the sort of machine versus the human as, as uh, the uh, instruments of production. So, um, the, uh, so, so that, that kind of absence, the absence of precedent, the kind of the difficulty of picking up uh, threads, I think, is also testimony to the significance of the subject and the kind of evasiveness which, with which both in the present and historically the profession of architecture uh, insists on not talking about um, this uh, subject. Even, I will add to Mabel's point about uh, statics classes, even in the professional, probably especially in the professional classes uh, that are given, the, the, the seminars and professional practice that are given as part of the education that we deliver um, in our various institutions to uh, future architects. So, um, so anyway, with that uh, you know, in mind, I, I hope that we can have, I'm sure that we will have a lively and uh, in a sense, self-generating discussion. I will only um, pose intermittently questions that already have been posed uh, by the organizers to the participants. And the idea generally is that there's a kind of spontaneous back and forth uh, into which you, you will be immediately invited as well. Uh, maybe we can think about this as a kind of collective brainstorming, uh, kind of thinking through and thinking out loud uh, around uh, these difficult questions. Um, uh, particularly since we, we don't have a whole lot to lean on. Um, but we do have uh, a wonderful um, panel of, uh, of speakers or, or conversant, uh, conversationalists, let's say, uh, on which uh, to lean um, this evening. Uh, and I'm just going to, um, if you don't have a program, I'll just kind of go through and try to highlight some of their, the important, what I think is the most immediately relevant biographical information uh, that is printed in your program for each participant. So first, Peggy Deemer, uh, who teaches in the School of Architecture at or the Yale School of Architecture, which is called Yale University, and also is a, is a widely um, published and, uh, and, and a very active uh, practitioner here in, uh, in New York, um, editor and writer uh, of many, many um, pieces. And I think in this case, um, particularly relevant are the volumes Building in the Future, Recasting Architectural Labor, and BIM, B, Building Information Modeling uh, in Academia, which is the machine actually that builds many of the buildings that I think we're alluding to here. It's an information machine um, uh, that both came out of very interesting symposia that Peggy organized uh, at Yale. And, and then the, the forthcoming, uh, I think I can say this, right, Architecture and Capitalism coming imminently um, and so on. So, so, uh, so Peggy Deemer. Um, uh, uh, next to Peggy is uh, Frederick Levra, a colleague, a uh, longtime colleague of mine at, at Columbia. Um, we've taught together and done many things together. And, and, and Fred uh, does many things that, again, cross our path here, uh, one of which has to do with his, his practice, which, which spans um, from, from New York to Switzerland to Afghanistan and to other parts of, uh, of the world. Uh, and so he, on the, on the ground, as it were, encounters uh, the matters um, at hand. Uh, some of this work includes the Research Center for the European Space Agency in Geneva. I mean, what a, what a, what a project. Uh, t uh, 12 primary schools, however, 12 primary schools and 20 basic clinics in Afghanistan. So from space agencies to clinics. Um, and a theater and industrial park in Kabul. Um, as well as work here in New York. And, and I should add to the, to the bio, uh, Fred has been teaching in uh, teaching studios in uh, the UAE, taking students there, uh, particularly in Dubai, um, and, and thinking through uh, architectural matters and urban questions with his students for some years now, also uh, at Columbia. And then uh, following Fred, uh, Andrew Ross, um, professor, professor of Social and Cultural Analysis at, at uh, NYU, uh, a public intellectual, a true public intellectual, uh, I think we can say contributor to the Nation, the Village Voice, New York Times, Art Forum, and, and many other um, uh, sort of platforms, uh, but also uh, absolutely prolific author of books with the best titles in the world. Uh, this, the, the most recent one being Bird on Fire, uh, about a city uh, that I think you probably can discern um, from its title, uh, otherwise known as the world's least sustainable city, Phoenix, that is. Uh, then uh, also nice work if you can get it, Life and Labor in Precarious Times, Fast Boat to China, Lessons from Shanghai, uh, Low Pay, High Profile, The Global Push for Fair Labor, so you know you can see the connections, uh, No Collar, The Humane Workplace and Its Hidden Costs, and uh, a, a personal favorite of mine, The Celebration Chronicles, 
um, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of property value uh, in Disney's new town. Uh, and then uh, finally, Bill von Esfeld, who I think we can thank uh, for supplying uh, us with some of the some of the sort of uh, nitty gritty uh, that that circulated. Uh, that is these the reports that Mabel mentioned uh, from Human Rights Watch. Uh, Bill is where he Bill is a senior researcher in the Middle East and North Africa division of Human Rights Watch. Um, after joining uh, that organization as a fellow in 2007, he uh, he did uh, field research and wrote reports on human rights violations in Western Sahara, Algeria, Egypt, and the UAE. Uh, and among these reports is uh, are, are the ones that we. Um, it was the one that we were, um, in a sense, alluding to again and that circulated amongst the participants in advance. That is the, again, a terrific title, The Island of Happiness, Exploitation of Migrant Workers on Sadiat Island, Abu Dhabi. Um, and in March, Human Rights Watch updated this, uh, this work uh, on Sadiat Island uh, with a new report, The Island of Happiness Revisited. Uh, and Bill's currently uh, focusing on abuses by all parties in Israel, Gaza, and the West Bank. Uh, he's uh, a graduate of NYU Law and a member of the New York Bar. So I'll uh, ask, I think, all of our panelists to join me uh, up here before you uh, and, and simply uh, now that it's become self-evident why they are sitting here. Um, and and I, I'm, basically what, the way this was set up was, was that um, Mabel, Cottenbury, and Beth uh, sent around questions uh, to, uh, I, you know, I think we could call them provocations or, or sort of uh, temptations to, uh, to, to the to the group here, and uh, with uh, the warning that, that you know we repose those questions in this setting. So, uh, so I think probably the best thing for me to do is to go sit over there. Um, well, whatever, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> you might, you guys might need this. There are occasionally may show up some images on the screen. I don't know are people going to need this. Okay, so I might. Okay, I'll concede. And uh, and so again, um, th the first one really has to do with. Um, people introducing themselves and their work in, in a bit more detail and their initial thoughts on the question. And I, would, I will say that, that this, um, I think, in a sense already uh, kind of compels us to, um, to think, to pause every time we use the overused word global uh, to describe the practice of architecture, the making of cities, or indeed anything else uh, in our world. Uh, to pause and and to think actually you know who in effect makes that world that word uh, what and 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 who out of what uh, material uh, and and with whose labor is that word global uh, made um, so uh, so I'm gonna sit down and begin this discussion okay ready here we go and you can answer these in whatever sequence or form you would like so here we go so what are your general thoughts on expanding cities, uh, global architectural design, and construction practices, just generally speaking. What's your current work, research, and or engagement with the new building programs undertaken by universities, governments, and cult cultural institutions, or private developers? And what can you tell us, I think just mostly generally at this point, about who builds, actually literally who builds uh, this architecture? So. I think we should start with those who are involved directly in the activity or at least thinking about the building of the architecture, don't you think? Shall I put Freddie on the spot? Yeah, um, maybe typically as an architect I brought some image because right. we can talk about all those things but sometime, you know, kind of introducing oneself and one's work with a few images. So if you don't mind working to do some more movement and Try to continue from here. Um, if I can get this thing going. Oops, that's not what I wanted, but yeah. Okay, um, I was at a panel discussion about a month ago and all the panelists knew what they were talking about and most of the people in the audience felt like they didn't know who we were, what we were talking, and so on. So I, I felt like this time I would give a very quick introduction, uh, hopefully quick enough, and obviously um, very superficial in a way, uh, because it's a very complicated and, and deep question. So 
What I wanted to show was just this multiplicity of context, how much we react as architect. Uh, obviously, we act, we create, we think, but also we uh, react a lot. And what I would like to show you is those four different contexts where I have been working in. I'm not exactly sure for which one of those contexts I've been invited. Uh, so maybe for the palette, for the different things. And uh, there are very different attitudes in each one of those context uh, because I've been put in different situations. Those contexts are much deeper than just geographical context, they are cultural context, they are uh, social, economical, political context. Those contexts define what people expect the architect to be, how the architect is supposed to assume some responsibility, negotiate, and um, since I've been educated in Switzerland, and maybe Switzerland is this very neutral ground, I would start very quickly with Switzerland. Um, as Reinhold was mentioning, I did this research center uh, in uh, Geneva for the European Space Agency. It's kind of a data center. And, but the, the main point is to say that um, Switzerland paid its worker very well. There are lots of... Uh, health insurance and everything. And I, I'm not so much making a point about Switzerland uh, as, as much as making it a contrast to New York. We think New York is uh, the, the daytime, the normal condition. Uh, in fact, for me, since not being raised or educated initially in New York, when I came to New York, I realized that the architecture in New York was, or the role of the architecture was very different. It was much more about uh, uh, somehow less social responsibility, uh, much more about uh, responding to s a very small percentage of the population as client. Um, here, also much less about long term. Uh, here it's a showroom that hopefully is still standing up, but as you build in New York some interior renovation, you know it can be destroyed within six months to six years. Um, so, so a very different mind frame. Um, I guess, as Reinhold mentioned, um, I have done a number of studios at Columbia University trying to understand uh, better what is the process in the context of Dubai. And I have been asked through those connections developed with the number of trips that I did at, uh, with my student at Columbia University to design some proposal for Dubai. Uh, who built my architecture? Unfortunately, nobody, uh, at least not in Dubai, uh, but maybe fortunately too. Um, I, I think the project here where it's really important to understand the concept of, the context of Dubai where usually it's certainly not responding to a need, it's not responding to a population, it's not responding to an ecology. There's no need to build in Dubai. Uh, Dubai is more an invention of a desire, an invention of uh, creating a market, and in that sense, um, it's, it's radically different context. It's about really creating an image, and what we're doing here was to try to question this notion of image. Um, the last context I want to show, which maybe I would go a little bit deeper, is a context where I felt uh, much more directly involved, much more directly involved also culturally, politically. Um, working in Afghanistan, um, I didn't end up in Afghanistan just uh, for fun or just by mistake. Um, maybe by mistake, but that's a longer story. Um, my wife is originally from Afghanistan and she ended up being a political refugee in Switzerland and we met the student in architecture too. and. Uh, ended up getting married, kids, but when uh, the American invaded or liberated Afghanistan, depending on the point of view, she really wanted to go back to her country. So I kind of followed up for a few months with my son and, and my wife, and I uh, realized there was a lot to do, a lot to build, a lot to get involved, and really a, a possibility to really help and, and you know provide an expertise even so. Initially, as a professor of rather theory, philosophy, new technology in regard to architecture, I was not necessarily the most adept uh, construction worker for third world development. But I met some people who kind of reuse uh, technology that was developed at uh, 
it's an Asian Institute of Technology, a system of interlocking bricks, bricks that were made out of aggregate from the local region that were stacking up very much like Lego. It was a very cheap and efficient way to do reinforced concrete. Nobody wanted to donate money to do clinics or school if at the first earthquake it would fall apart. So they needed to be reinforced concrete, but traditional reinforced concrete use enormous amount of wood, enormous amount of money, enormous amount of imported elements. This was a very intelligent system that was developed very cheaply. The problem was then to develop, to produce those bricks. So my role was even supervising kind of production of raw material, checking if the gravel was the right gravel, checking if the bricks were well made and so on. But it was kind of also fascinating to become kind of an entrepreneur producing raw material. But then also teaching people. Uh, Afghanistan doesn't have much or anything, uh, doesn't have education. You need to educate the worker to slightly new technology. Um, luckily, they have an enormous labor force. People want to learn, want to be employed. And um, we did a number of workshops where we uh, started telling people how our new system could work. Um, it's a pretty simple system, but still it's quite different, needs different degree of precision than having a lot of mortar. Same with the beams, again, not using woods, which is very scarce. Uh, again, teaching people how to produce their own beams, and the entire system was kind of a, almost like a, literally a Lego system, but at a full scale. Um, we built a few <coughs> prototype houses, hoping that uh, people would recognize this system as being interesting. Um, but uh, we got a contract uh, through USAID to build school and clinics. Uh, where the money is coming from, why there's money from the United States to build beautiful projects like school and clinics in Afghanistan, that nevertheless are some kind of a, a colonization, uh, imposing a single school system throughout the entire country was obviously ridiculous. Um, but nevertheless, it was an interesting project to, to work on. So as an architect, you can, again, do rendering, provide illustration, which seems very uh, simplistic. Uh, but on the other hand, the Ministry of Education or the Ministry of Health had never seen what potentially the drawing that the American were giving them could look like, and there was some major misunderstanding. Uh, but also really going onto the site, constructing, being with people. And uh, those schools and clinics are relatively small, but nevertheless are kind of massive too. Um, so it's not just mobilize, mobilizing the, the community, but also being able to have a dialogue to start uh, getting to all those uh, ceremony for opening uh, those, uh, and those uh, schools and clinics. And as you can see, I'm in good company here. I never managed to get the turban right, uh, so I'm not wearing it. Um, but it's important to, you cannot bring something new and not go there. I mean, maybe in that respect, I was too Swiss and not uh, American enough, but uh, you have to go on the site, you have to convince people, you have to get involved, you have to uh, participate and um, people, uh, were extremely uh, friendly, extremely helpful, and extremely generous in uh, allowing their country to be rebuilt, you know, obviously. Um, that happened through a layer of engineer, architect, local people who could translate the basic things. Uh, but ultimately, it uh, has been a, a great pleasure to feel like you can actually do something useful. And uh, uh, I haven't been back to see how the entire spectrum of the system can continue uh, by having uh, doctors, by having teachers, because the infrastructure that we build is only one tiny part. But um, I, I think it was a great pleasure to be able to, to be useful. So, you know, those images look like, well, we can do something nice if we try. Sometimes it's possible. It's also very complex. Um, what I tried to show you were really those four contexts saying that you know, depending on what you're being asked, you can respond radically different things. And uh, I certainly don't hope to give you any uh, clear conclusion. This is more kind of a quick introduction saying, um, 
have been invited and I'm just trying to show a little bit of my work. Thank you. So any responses? We can leave it up there if you want, yeah? I, I do have, I have one, there's a, okay, first of all, one notice is that even in the modest, that an architect has been or at work here, there's a, the detail of the cantilevered uh, course. There's one course of brick that cantilevers out framing the windows that I'm assuming uh, uh, demanded a great deal of effort, um, both design-wise and production-wise. But so it's, you know, I thought you might mention that and it's worth acknowledging. But, um, but I, the question that I have would, would, you know, to try to pivot this into the, the bigger, the broader context, um, uh, kind of related to the spectrum that you were, you were talking about, would be actually, uh, in many situations, these things occur simultaneously, right? In other words, forms of production of the sort that you just showed occur simultaneously uh, with, for example, like in Kabul, the, the US Embassy, right? I would assume that those same laborers are not, or, or their you know, relatives or colleagues are not necessarily uh, producing. Do you, can, can we say something about the, the relations of production um, uh, on the other side of the coin mm -hmm. to that and how this might yeah. factor? Well, I mean, first of all, it's the same client. That's, I right. think, yeah, is, that's is, a, is really right. a big same problem. Right. Um, ultimately, even so, those school and clinics are ultimately very useful for the population. Uh, it was paid by the Republican administration who wanted to have Karzai re-elected, therefore Bush could be re-elected. So you end up trying to you know, help people, but you realize that you're part of a global system mm -hmm. in that sense, which is really not what I ever wanted to necessarily participate in. But um, you, you, you take what you can and you do what you, you can within mm -hmm. that. Um, so it's, it's always, always gray. It's always complex. Mm -hmm. It's always ugly, maybe. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think what was important w is to, to really try to understand some logic uh, and translate the logic. Like, for instance, a set of bricks we were making were highly uh, uh, demanding in terms of uh, workforce. It means that you need to employ a lot of people. And we thought it was very good for the people they, because they want employment. What if you bring some steel or prefabricated stuff? Yeah, and right. So, um, so, so you, need, you need to at least understand the logic and try to do it. Uh, for most of the building that were much more for the, let's say, American, like the embassy and so on, uh, they imported container that they just landed there uh, for about a year and a half while they were building the new embassy. Um, so everybody in the American embassy were living in container. They import every single item of food that they eat or drink. Um, so, you know, I, I think um, they, they usually also would import some workers that had some qualification. Um, and those qualifications, again, are related to a set of parameters that are, you know, completely Western that, so there were a lot of uh, contracting firm that could have done the work, but they didn't have the right paperwork. They weren't certified, they weren't, you know, ISO 9000 or whatever. So um, I think we have a set of, of rule, even for procurement or for anything like that, which, uh, uh, usually doesn't respond to context or is biased in a way to profit some very specific interest. So, because I, I assume, I, I know that others, others also have some prepared thoughts uh, and, and so on. So I, I, we're trying to, in a sense, string things together uh, related to these questions. Um, and so I'm really just inviting others to sort of jump in similarly. Uh, at any point, but because what Fred, what you're just talking about really is basically a response to the second question that, that everybody was asked, uh, which has to do um, with th this sort of ambivalence uh, uh, and, and, and yet uh, inevitability 
of, uh, of, of, the, um, of some form of responsibility uh, with respect to uh, those who, who build the buildings that one designs. So, uh, so the questions that pose is that where do those construction workers come from? Where do they live? What, what is the legal status? Uh, what is being done to address their basic needs, housing, health care, child care, et cetera? Furthermore, what does this new architecture demand from them? For example, architects require high standards of detailing, so this is like the cantilevered uh, brick, uh, and technological craft. How are such expectations met by the local builders and at what cost? And you just described a very vivid scenario in which there's a, you know, in a sense, two worlds uh, running parallel with respect to these, uh, these matters. Um, so, uh, so I pose, I, I invite again uh, my colleagues to respond to Fred. Peggy looks like she's well, I, ready to um, go. I, I, I don't know whether I can respond to, to Fred. I, I think that's amazing work. Um, I, I think what strikes me, and I think uh, many of the architects here, is the, um, the fact that this is outside the normal system of, of architectural contracting right. and the, the owner <laughs> contract contractor architect um, relationships and the kind of do it yourselfness that allows um, you to actually be influential in that work is is exceptional and uh, so I begin to think more about why it is that the more normal um, constructs of, of architecture its practices its contracts and all those things don't don't operate in that way or preclude that that kind of thing. So I, I feel like my comments would diverge from that, but I want to. I hope we will come back to to that. So go ahead. No, feel um, free to diverge. Yeah. The um, it just it it just needs to be said that the uh, the issue of of the architects' possibility to influence procurement and labor um, is virtually new um, in the normal contracts, and um, so the issue that just needs to get on the table is is that architects are not brought to the table to this discussion. We we are just not there, and so. Um, would that we were, would that we were actually having a conversation about how it is that architects could answer these questions that are so important. Um, but you have to go outside of normal practice in order to, to do the kind of work that you're doing. Um, for me, the issue about uh, why architects are not at the, the table um, has to do with many kind of different le levels of conceptual notions of practice, architectural practice, of, of design, you know, that, that go outside of the kind of contracts that we have. But um, it does seem to me that the, um, it, all, all of the responsibilities that we are asking here are the owners. And so that's why we're not at the table. And so how is it that one can shift the relationship the architects have with the owners? And certainly I think the kind of discourse that's going on now is that we share risk, we share responsibility, we share rewards. The, the, a different kind of set of relationships has, has to happen. Um, and part of that is, I, I think, how we can redefine um, design, this is more of a conceptual shift, but the way that we would design design is, is not one where architects design and then the um, contractors build. You know, everyone's talking about getting rid of that division between designing and making or, you know, whatever. Um, but I think the one way to actually think about doing that is, is that we're all designers. Every single person in, in, in the construction industry are, are designers. Fabricators are designers, the contractors are designers. If we can rethink of our roles in that way, it'll be a conceptual, conceptual shift that um, helps us do that divide. It, it, it means that the architect um, gets at the table around a shared um, discussion of procurement, um, which is that, that procurement is not different than design and people who are at the procurement or labor end are also designing. That's one part of it, we're all designers. The other part is to make architects realize that what we do is work, that what we do is labor. I think there's an incredible resistance to thinking that we as architects are doing um, something that means we go to work um, and we are doing labor. We tend to think of this as we do design, we do art, we do all these other things, which is why when you ask people about um, a question, I was on a panel recently and um, a question to one of our speakers was, um, I'm thinking of becoming an architect, um, what shall I look forward to in, in, in that profession? Oh, it's not a profession, it's a calling. <laughs> so you know, that, it's said. like boggling, um, as if, as if <laughs> I'm open for abuse. I'm open to work 24/7. Um, I'm, you know, but lucky me, maybe I will actually get some 
what fame, glory, attention, I don't know what it is. It's, it's, it's amazing to me that, that we resist the idea that when we go to work, all of us, whether we're staff, whether we're, whether we're partners, um, that we don't think that we're going to work, we're going to design. Um, we have to admit that we're going to work, <laughs> and if we go to work, then we can actually begin to think about the fact that there is no difference between us and the labor at the other end. And it's one of the real assets, I think, of nice work, if you can get it, is you're kind of insistent that um, that within kind of the post-Fordist knowledge economy, that more and more we're forced to actually see that there's that there's that alignment. And I think until we actually think that way, we're it will be noblesse oblige. Oh, maybe we can actually tell the owner that we don't really like to work with that contractor because we know, but with no power. But we have we have to actually see ourselves as at the same same, not just that we're empowered to be at the same table, but that we conceptually are doing work in the same way. Um, so I, I, that's, that's going to be my, my big thing here, because the issue is how to get architects to the table so we can actually talk about the questions that are here. We're not there. I think I'm, I'm going to ask Andrew to follow up, because I, <laughs> I, I have a feeling that one will connect uh, to okay. the other. Yeah. Um. Well, I want to say, first of all, I'm very gratified to be on the panel, and thanks to Mabel and Kadambari and Beth for doing this. It's a topic of discussion that's long overdue, and I hope it's the beginning of a, a, a fruitful line of inquiry and self-criticism uh, in the architectural community. I think Peggy has described very well what is the status quo um, and, and, the, and the prevailing mentality, uh, which is partially defined by, by contracts and client relationships and so on and so forth, although I, I think I would respond by saying there are a lot of other professionals, uh, even in the creative sectors, who are in much the same position, who are being pulled into these debates more and more. Um, it hasn't historically been part of the professional credo of, um, of, of, of a lot of us uh, to have to think about this, but ironically, it's as our professions have become degraded and deformed. Um, that we, we become part of the chain of accountability in a sense mm -hmm. and, and, and precisely because we no longer um, we no longer have a kind of monopolistic uh, control over uh, over our mark of our services in the marketplace which was the original the whole rationale for professionalism in the first place um, but let me just describe briefly um, some of my role in the backdrop to this, uh, which is primarily as a labor advocate and, and, and a campaign organizer, um, <clears throat> because uh, I've been active on two campaigns that are relevant to our discussion. One was the Fair Labor Coalition at NYU. The other one was the Gulf Labor Coalition. And there are several members of the Gulf Labor Coalition here uh, tonight, Greg Shalette and Hans Hacke and, and Judith Barry also over there. Um, and I'll try and be brief, the story really t in 2006 when the NYU administration announced they would build a campus on Sadiat Island in Abu Dhabi. Um, <clears throat> we, um, this was just after uh, Bill's first report on, um, from HRW on substandard labor conditions of migrant workers in, uh, in, in the United Arab Emirates was published. And um, there were many concerns about uh, NYU's plans to build a campus there at the time, most of them revolving around academic freedom. Typically, you know, academics think about their self-interest, and, and rightfully so. Um, but we decided at that time that um, uh, we would take on the issue of migrant workers' rights as well. So we thought it was uh, very unfair and unjust to, uh, to ask teachers to, to teach in classrooms that had been built on the backs of abused workers and were maintained by exploited workers. And at the same time, the Louvre and the Guggenheim had announced plans to build there also. And so we had this idea of using the cultural prestige of these three brands and leveraging the cultural prestige of these, pr these three uh, brands in order to try and raise the bar uh, on regional labor standards. If we could get decent working conditions at each of these sites, uh, it would have a demonstration effect and would have some impact on, on labor standards in the region. And so at NYU, at least, we started at NYU, we pushed the administration really hard to adopt fair labor provisions <laughs> 
for the construction. And uh, they, they were reluctant to do so initially, but ultimately uh, they, did, um, they did formulate some fair labor standards. They fell short of what we had recommended and we worked in conjunction with Human Rights Watch on, on those recommendations. Um, but even so, they were, they were far superior to any of the other labor standards uh, in the region at the time. Uh, of course, standards and provisions are only as good as their enforcement. And so we then pushed on the administration to appoint an independent or third party monitor to audit the conditions. Um, uh, independent monitors were unacceptable to the government uh, in Abu Dhabi. And uh, so they ended up um, uh, inviting or hiring, recruiting a firm that was already very active in the region that already had contracts with the state and was therefore not exactly an independent monitor. And that monitor recently issued its first report. Um, at the same time, uh, the, the national AAUP, the American Association of University Professors, um, and uh, I'm a, a member of Committee A of the National AUP, we drafted a policy statement on the rights of academic professionals overseas at offshore campuses. And for the first time, we included a provision that, that uh, spoke to the rights of, uh, of the workers constructing the campuses and also the maintenance workers. It was the first time in the AUP's history that, um, that non-instructional staff and their rights were, uh, were brought into the purview of the AUP. And this is just one example I'm mentioning of a, a profession, another profession um, that hasn't uh, traditionally had within its own purview um, uh, any, any sense of accountability to, to non-instructional staff. Um, a couple of years later, actually in 2009, in a conference in Beirut at Ashgal Alwan, um, Walid Rad and Beth Stryker and myself and several other artists uh, in the region uh, decided to start a similar campaign around the Guggenheim and um, with, with similar goals in many ways. Um, and we pressured the Guggenheim administrators and, uh, and the government wing in Abu Dhabi that was constructing Sadiat Island to adopt fair labor standards. Uh, initially, we didn't get satisfactory results, so we, we decided to launch a boycott campaign. And there's about, what, 1,500, I think, folks who've joined the campaign at this point, who signed on the boycott. Uh, very prominent figures in the international art world and, and generated a lot of impact and really was a kind of milestone, a historic milestone in the international art world. Um, largely as a result, the, the government did adopt um, a set of fair labor standards for construction of the island, which is a luxury tourist development with a cultural quarter on it, cultural district on it. Um, and once again, there were shortcomings in the fair labor provisions, but we got them, we got some of them. And once again, we didn't get an independent monitor. Uh, we got Price Waterhouse Cooper, which is a, the kind of transnational auditing firm that, uh, that states, especially totalitarian states, especially uh, like to recruit for those purposes, not exactly an independent monitor. Um, so we haven't gotten, um, we haven't gotten a lot of traction in inquiries about how, uh, how, how the monitor is doing its work, if it's doing its work at all right now, so the boycott remains in effect. Uh, but we're still very much in conversation with um, Guggenheim officials and uh, Abu Dhabi officials about how to move forward. And I will say just in concluding, uh, in the course of these deliberations, we, we did approach the offices of some of the, the architects, the architects who were uh, involved in designing. Uh, Rafael Vignoli, who's designing uh, the NYU campus, and uh, Frank Gehry, who's doing the, uh, the Guggenheim. We didn't get any response from Vignoli's office. Um, at one point, uh, Frank Gehry's office wanted to send along a legal representative, as I recall, uh, to discuss matters with us, but uh, somehow it didn't happen. Um, but we're still trying to work on that front and, um, and still trying to figure out how to involve architects at that level, at that stature, how to involve them in the chain of accountability, uh, really, that is, um, is an important part of this conversation. 
So, uh, so there are other professionals, just to go back to that original point, Peggy, there are other professions where, like architecture, where this has not been you know, part and parcel of the credo of the profession. Yeah, I, I definitely want to be here, but I, I'll just say I think one of the things that inhibits um, architecture from um, being um, of that same category of, of professionals is our concentration, you know, as I was saying, not just on design, but that we're making an object. And as long as we think of ourselves as making an object as opposed to as performing a service, um, <coughs> it is a very, very easy way to, to say that how it gets built is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to, is to make that object or to provide that object for the owner. And I, I, th I think a real um, conceptual shift needs to happen where we're not making objects um, anymore. We're providing a service. Um, and in that way, we can then begin to talk about best practices for those services and, and see ourselves as analogous as some of the disciplines, I think, that you're talking about. You, you know, one thing that occurs to me in, in, in terms of thinking ways in to the question, particularly for professionals, um, and to connect some of the dots before I, we hear from Bill, uh, again, on whose own labor a lot of the, this whole discussion, to some extent, rests. Um, but uh, is, you know, okay, since you mentioned um, teaching, uh, these things do come together in professional schools. Like, in other words, the narrative that Peggy offered as to the role of the architect is taught. It's something that's constructed and taught. It's, it's, it's of course, um, as it were, institutionalized by institutions like the AIA, by NCAR, by all the various professional organizations, but then it's taught. And in that sense, it's repeated again and again and again. Uh, so it's performed, uh, let's say. Uh, and, and the, but the space in which it's performed, we don't usually consider to, be, to belong, as it were, to the discursive space of architecture, which is what I was referring to before, uh, the pro so-called professional practice class. Uh, and, and, and so this is my question in a sense before we, um, I'm gonna read one more question also from the organizers and then I'll ask Bill, but uh, the, this question has to be, one of the, the, the acts that's performed, uh, I, I would venture, maybe some colleagues have some thoughts uh, in that kind of a class is how to get around the unions. In other words, because a difference, uh, you know, with, with, between big universities in New York and, and their activities overseas probably, I don't know, I mean, maybe you have some information on this, uh, would have to do with their, um, the, the, the kind of, the degree to which they're bound to uh, use union labor if indeed it exists, uh, depending on where one is working. And this is something that's certainly the case at Columbia where there are all kinds of analogous mm. controversies, even locally, mm -hmm. about uh, the efforts to evade uh, that that uh, mm -hmm. um, imperative. So, uh, but the point is that, that this is this, this technique of, in a sense, you know, getting around the high costs, higher costs sometimes or often associated with unions and, and by that, in that sense, the ethical um, challenge posed by, uh, by that is actually taught it's, and it's repeated at a very practical level again and again and again um, in, in those, non, those, as it were, non-discursive discourses. Uh, that we call professional practice. So I, I wonder if, if there's something, is this fir first of all, something further to say about union labor and its relationship contractually or otherwise to, to the production of buildings and cities, and then maybe also Peggy vis-a-vis -vis the, the teaching side. Uh -huh. Can, I, can yeah, I just sure, say sure. One, one thing about that? Um, I think, I mean, uh, there's, there's a very important comparison, of course, between, you know, building in, in, in countries where there's relatively strong labor right. regulation and where it is legal <laughs> to have right, unions. Right. Um, the the design juggernaut that um, that has that has been running a pace in, in in China and the Middle East especially, uh, and where architects have been more or less invited to uh, to be aesthetically free in ways that they cannot be. I mean, that's another yeah, 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 it, yeah. It, it's another way really of talking about the same kind of issue that there's enough money. Um, because those countries or those states uh, need the brand, uh, need a prestigious brand and are prepared to pay for it. Um, but there are also countries with very weak or, or, or zero labor regulation and, and where labor exploitation is likely to, to proliferate. Um, so, um, so ironically, uh, I mean, this is a paradox of the profession in some ways. Ironically, there, there, there's a kind of celebration of being able to 
um, to design in countries like this in yeah. ways that would not be possible here uh, because of the stronger regulatory right. environment. Right. But by that same token, um, obviously you're, you're entering into, as an architect, you're entering into um, uh, a, a more nefarious kind of contract, right. not only with respect to the authoritarian state um, that is hiring you to do the work, but also with respect to the labor right. conditions. But I also just wanted to respond very briefly to Peggy's comment about how architects are trained to make objects. In, 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 in many ways, it's, you could say the same of engineers who work for Apple, who are, who are trained and who, who make objects, who design objects. Um, but they've been pulled into the chain of accountability most recently, as Mabel, uh, as Mabel mentioned. Um, because uh, the large technology companies are now being targeted in much the same way as the large apparel companies were, were targeted during the heyday of the anti-sweatshop movement. And uh, creative professionals who are on the design side um, find themselves increasingly implicated. Um, and uh, so structurally speaking, there's a lot of similarities between the engineer in App, uh, who works for Apple in this country in Cupertino and, uh, and the architect who's now working on global or transnational projects that involve a long subcontracting chain. Would you yeah. agree? Yeah, no, I, 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 think, I think it's a good point, but I, I, I think part, part of the difference is that those, those engineers are working directly with the fabricators, which work directly with, with the labor force, and so in some way they can't do their work without acknowledging that, whereas um, I think the architects, if, if we're kind of thinking about how the future can, can work, if I'm saying on the one hand, the fabricators and the laborers who do that are designers like, like we're designers, the way that we're going to have to think about what we do is how we actually manage all of those people, as opposed to whether we have singularly provided um, the hmm. best object in some way. And so there's an identification with, with the fabricator that has to happen that does have to do with that making, but, but our role in that can no longer be that we're the singular author of, of object making. I, I think we're providing a service around managing all of those different players who, who themselves are designers. I, so mm -hmm. you're right, but I think there still is a shift that needs to happen around what it is that we're doing in relationship to those other, other players. Mm -hmm. But, but it would seem to me that our curriculum committees could simply insist that we address the professional practice class in such a way that we don't necessarily teach evasive maneuvers with respect to union labor. Um, you know, at least not quite so overtly. I, I suspect, yeah. I don't know. You know, it seems to me that it's kind of fairly immediate thing we could do. No? Just one thing about I know. that. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get Bill into this. In our professional classes, professional they have nothing to do with, <laughs> with union labor. They do have to do with Phil Bernstein, who teaches our professional right, classes, right, that's who, what of I mean, course, right. is, is you know um, uh, um, more than a BIM advocate, is a rev advocate. But right. um, but but what's interests me is um, he's really using it as a platform to really wipe out the existing. AIA contracts that we have. Um, yeah, that's another thing. Yeah, so. no, that's interesting. Yeah, okay, but we will con to be continued. Yeah. Um, but as uh, we, you already know, um, uh, you know the the more than just the subtext, the the premise uh, of 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 this discussion really uh, are these two reports the, that I mentioned that that Bill has done. Now, I'm just going to read question number three um, that speaks most directly. It's kind of <laughs> like this is an exam, and you are. Uh, recently, can, and then ask Bill to to, uh, to fill us in on, on, on things. I can stay here uh, all night because being a human rights advocate is, is also a vocation and a calling. Right? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, fantastic. We've all been called to this table in some way. Um, well, so, okay, okay, so here, here's our, our charge in this case. Recently, contentious issues, I mean, and I think this is more or less a direct allusion to these, to these reports, have emerged around migrant temporary or seasonal pools of laborers, including work visa statuses in foreign countries, exorbitant recruitment fees that workers pay in their home countries. So, so, you know, it's not just about the construction site, right? It's how you even get to the construction site. Um, the uh, substandard housing for workers, unsafe working conditions on construction sites, issues of compensation when projects are stopped due to quickly changing economical conditions, etc. And, and then, then question 
what is the architects, and, and I think, you know, per the preceding discussion, we, we can amend this to say what is profession X is, uh, you know, engineer, uh, you know, academic, whatever. Uh, ethical responsibility and a chain of accountability that is diffuse and spread among many participants into the construction process. What should, what should we be asking? What professional uh, or legal structures, contracts, etc., can facilitate discussions around these issues and with various consultants and managers? And I think in that sense that the presence of, of, a pro of documents, the sheer documentation and, you know, of, of, and case studies that I want to ask Bill to speak more about, um, belong in this list, in this list of instruments, like practical instruments that, that enable uh, progress to be made on these uh, fronts. So, so, Bill. Well, thanks very much. I'm really delighted to get the chance to be here. Um, working for a human rights group, um, you know, we speak a specific language, and now I'm working on Israel, and, you know, one of the constant problems I have is talking to Israelis and trying to get them to understand that human rights has an Israeli voice, and it's not only for Palestinians, and that you have to be able to speak the language yourself to really be able to appreciate its universality, and translating human rights talk, uh, you know, to a room full of professional architects and, um, and, and students is, you know, is, is, is a great opportunity uh, for that reason, so thank you. Um, I think, you know, I look at this as a kind of a typical, in a way, it, it fits in with a typical business and human rights kind of problematic or, or framework, which is that um, I'm not, you know, where architects come into this picture, um, which is not, uh, where architects come into the picture is not something I've thought about extensively, but in terms of other businesses, I mean, the same kinds of arguments often come up, or the same kind of questions. Um, you know, well, if I'm, a, if I'm a factory owner, I'm primarily responsible for what happens on the factory floor. I'm responsible for workplace safety. Um, but I don't necessarily think about, you know, the environmental impact of the factory that I've just put in um, on a village next door, you know, what water it's using, what effluent it's producing. You know, it's these sort of expanding spheres of your impact, um, which is where, you know, the, the, the nitty gritty of the debate always happens. Um, and I think that um, there's some really interesting work that's been done by the special rapporteur on business and human rights, um, a guy named John Ruggie, um, who you can sort of easily find online and it might be useful or, you know, uh, interesting to some of you to sort of check that out more as you grapple with these questions. Um, Saudi at Island, uh, you know, where I did a, a bit of work before moving on to um, Israel, the West Bank and Gaza, um, you see that dynamic played out as well. Um, you know, an example would be the Louvre, which started out as sort of one of the most proactive or seemingly proactive of the three cultural institutions that we were focusing on, NYU, uh, the Guggenheim, and the Louvre. The Louvre first was the first to come out and say, yes, we have some sort of objective standard um, for what we're going to be, for th that will be the, the baseline for monitoring the impact of our, our involvement here, and this is the SA 8000 standard. But since then, they have not really, um, done anything to make that enforceable, uh, have not given any concrete um, guarantees that are specifically applicable to the situation on the ground. Um, you know, in terms of independent monitoring, there's nothing going on there. And the responses from the Louvre to our continued prodding are this sort of stonewalling that, that one often gets in a business and human rights context. Well, um, construction hasn't started yet, so there's no problem for us to solve as of this moment. Um, when construction does start, it will be under the control of our uh, Emirati development partner, and we aren't actually building it. So it's sort of, who builds your architecture? I don't know, and, and it's not my problem. Um, but, um, you know, so that's, that's sort of the most basic problem, is, you know, the, the uh, necessity to expand one's interpretation of what one uh, is responsible for uh, by thinking about what it is that one can influence and what one can leverage, as, as Andrew was, was speaking of. And there are two forms of leverage here. I mean, there's the institutions themselves, um, and then there are the really superstar architects that have been um, gathered together to build them. And what's going on is an incredible branding of an empty space. I mean, this was, 
this was a desert, I mean, it's not as crazy as the desert islands that were completely man-made off the coast of Dubai, you know, where you've got things in the shape of the world and a giant palm tree and, and stuff like that that are just sand trucked out there. But Sadiat Island was also excessively, uh, extensively developed with sand being trucked out. I mean, it, there was really nothing there except for some native deer and, and, and waterfowl and swamps. Um, but now it's not that anymore. Now it's, it's not just the Louvre, it's the Jean Nouvel Louvre. You know, it's not just you know, a museum, it's the Zaha Hadid Museum. Um, it's the Frank Gehry uh, Guggenheim, a, a, another Frank Gehry Guggenheim. Um, and so it's, it's you know, turning this into a, a, a place on the cultural map. I don't know sort of in the minds of the, the rulers of Abu Dhabi what the map of the world looks like, but you, you know, um, for the type of people they're trying to attract, but presumably they would be jet setters who just hop from the Biennale to Abu Dhabi and they now include it on their itinerary. And, that's, you know, that, and they can also play golf on Sadiat Island now and stay in their uh, luxury hotel. So it's that kind of branding that's going on and that's where the influence and the leverage comes from. And that, in a way, is an incredible opportunity to really push the authorities to raise labor standards in a way that we've never seen in that region. I mean, the United Arab Emirates, 90% of the population is foreign and will never be able to get citizenship, and many of them are construction workers who will, you know, they, they have very little ability to advocate for their rights. Um, union, not only are unions banned, virtually any NGO is, is prohibited. I had to request Four, four times I had to request a meeting with the head of a local sort of group whose only activity was actually to facilitate the um, transfer of corpses of migrant workers who died in, in the Emirates back to their home countries. I mean, completely non-threatening sort of activity, and yet he was terrified to meet me in case he, he was exposed as talking to Human Rights Watch. That's the level of sort of anxiety. And of course, a worker who comes from a Southeast Asian country um, will not be informed that they have any rights to claim um, and will not have the language with which to claim them, um, you know, which is where a group like Human Rights Watch tries to get involved and, and, and boost that voice. Um, uh, sorry, but where I was going with that is that, so the Louvre is one example of uh, sort of, say, a business that wants to limit its sphere of influence to the maximum possible level, right, or the minimum possible level. Um, but even that fails to capture, I mean, I'm thinking about the question about the, the organizational chart and the flow chart, and what I'm, my sort of response to that was, well, what it should look like is it's got to start way down low, and it's got to have as many arrows pointing in both directions um, to every other piece on the organizational chart as, as possible. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead to a question that people no, probably right. don't I'll, even I'll know has, it. has been asked. Read it? I, mean, uh, I, I have it right here. You know, it's, it's worth reading, I think. So uh, this is an official, officially question number four. This is quite <laughs> fun. Uh, we eventually we'll disclose <laughs> this entire list. Uh, so a complex net network co connects patrons, clients, architects, contractors, construction managers, local workers, tradesmen, migrant laborers, etc. This network may be imagined as an expanded org chart or for a large global project. In such a chart, the construction workers are most likely at the end, uh, so it's already been alluded to also, the, and, and, uh, and possibly the furthest removed from the architects. Therefore, there's a widening gap between those who design and those who build. How may this type of org chart be reimagined for integrating fair labor practices? What other types of practices, activism, art, journalism, et cetera, that are engaging these issues and rallying for better uh, conditions for the construction workers? So there, there you have it. Right. So, so my, my thought in response to that is that the first thing you need is really um, an awareness of the entire context uh, of, of who's, who's involved in this activity that uh, you as an architect are helping to get off the ground. Um, and so I think it would be useful just to bring this down to a very human level, who builds your architecture, to just imagine yourself as, as um, you're from a Southeast Asian country. Many, maybe the majority are now coming from Bangladesh. Um, these are people who may never have left their village. Um, uh, they um, tend to speak an incredible number of languages, but Arabic and English are not among them. Um, you have very little chance of ever pulling yourself out of poverty if you stay where you are. So you've heard about uh, an opportunity to go to the rich Gulf and work for a few years and then come back home and, you know, you could buy property, you could invest, you could, you, could, you know, you don't have to go to the Grameen Bank. Um, you've got your own money. Um, so you would, the, and the way you've heard to get there is to go to a, a city and you go to a labor supply agency uh, who says, well, We'll get you there, but you're going to have to pay us, say, $3,000, $2,500, $3,000. That's more money than you've ever seen in your life, and you don't have it. 
So you sell your wife's gold jewelry, you mortgage your small house, and you collect all the money you can from your relatives. Maybe you get a thousand bucks. You need to go to a money lender. The money lender, because you have no real collateral, you can't go to a bank, um, even the Grameen Bank. And uh, so you, you take out a loan from a money lender at 10% per month interest. Um, you don't sign a contract, or maybe you sign a contract, or maybe you just sign your name on a blank piece of paper in your home country. Then you wind up in uh, Abu Dhabi, or the Dubai airport, and you get sent to uh, Abu Dhabi. There you sign a different contract, written in Arabic and English, which you don't understand, which may be completely different from what you thought you were doing. It may not only be a different job. Um, I met people who thought they were going to be working, uh, cooking food for uh, people in a, in a hotel, because the name of the construction site was the name of a hotel, but they wound up building the hotel for about a third of the money that they were promised. The average was often 50% less than uh, you were promised by this um, labor sending agency in your home country was what you actually wound up getting paid. Um, so now you're, you're on the work site, um, you may not be happy, uh, you know, you're, you're there for about three years, you know, maybe you're, you're being underpaid, maybe you're being paid late, maybe working conditions are poor, maybe your housing conditions are poor, and you, but the, you really have no recourse because you owe money to the guy who, who, who lent it to you and you are gonna have to work for whatever it is that you, you're, you've been offered. You can't, well, you can't unionize to demand better uh, treatment. You also can't switch employers because your work visa is limited to that specific employer. So if you quit, you are illegally present in the country. Um, and it would be difficult to quit anyway because the employer has your passport. So if you quit, you'll be deported. If you try and get a new job, you'd be deported. Some people do quit and work for other employers, but only the most unscrupulous employers who'd be willing to take the risk to employ you, and in exchange for taking that risk, they're going to exploit you even worse um, and, and pay you even less. Um, so that's the sort of broad sphere. I mean, that's the whole sort of human story that one needs to think of um, and that one needs to capture when one thinks about one's responsibilities, um, not just who's, you know, the, the thing that the Abu Dhabi authorities have been very good at is saying, look at how beautiful the worker's village is. Um, and that is a significant improvement. That's actually very important. Um, I mean, there were, there were real horror stories of people being crammed 12 to a room, um, and the room was being rented by a company that didn't bother to pay the electricity or water bills. So you have 12 men in a room, 12 angry men um, in a room with no air conditioning, no water, no working sewage system in a desert um, where they're, they're not from there. You know, they're from a completely different uh, climate as well as you know, just the general misery of that situation. So, sorry, that's, I just wanted to sort of throw out this broad sort of, you know, if we're talking about organizational charts, this is the sort of thing that needs to be, to be grasped. And I won't go into the contractual mm -hmm. sort of ways right. to get there, but I think they do exist. Can I yeah. just say, I mean, I, not, not to diminish that as, as human rights abuses, but one could chart a very, very similar um, uh, set of procedures and activities for the graduate of architecture schools who's taken out a loan of over $100,000 to go to school, um, then will probably work for somebody with no guarantee of how long they're going to be employed, no limit on the hours, no bargaining. Um, position, um, no way of sitting at the table when, when the um, uh, partner um, negotiates the contract with the owner that will then have effect on their work. None of that. No guarantee of, of lasting, lasting work. None of, none of those things. And yet they're absolutely bound to work in these conditions because they've taken out that loan. When can living, you know, in a small apartment, two bedrooms, five people, because that's the only way that they can live in New York, it's, it's, it's a similar situation. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to say that we have those conditions. I'm saying those star architects will never listen to that, well, I mean, won't, won't hear that, because they don't even understand it in their own office when they go to work. They don't even understand it. It's not a labor condition. So my feeling is until they get it at, in the office, they're not going to get it on, on, on something that they actually have no um, uh, managerial power to go for. One, they do, and they're not even doing it. So, you know. Well, to sort of deliberately misinterpret that, um, <laughs> I mean, you know, one could say, I'm not saying you're saying this, one could, and, and this is a business, 
right? These guys are making a choice. You know, you can starve at home or you can go work in the Emirates and you're not children. Um, you know, you, well, maybe you didn't really sign a contract, but you kind of knew what you were getting into. You must have known somebody else from Bangladesh who'd been, you know, forgive me, screwed over by, you know, by, by this experience, and, and you did it anyway. And, you know, migration is a global, economic migration is a global thing. We, we can't just, you know, Pollyanna as, assume, sorry, Pollyanna was completely wrong. We can't just assume that, you know, there's an easy fix to this. Well, there, there's not an easy fix to this, but there are standards. Um, you know, for one thing, it, one obvious difference is that, you know, these people are getting completely cheated from what they thought um, they were going to get into. I mean, in a, and I, you know, there can, there, I could see parallels there as well. Um, but, you know, in a, in a more blatant way, like you sign a contract that you're going to get paid X amount and then you get to your work site and you're given a different contract, half of the amount is paid to you, you're doing a different job, you know, et cetera. There's a, there's a difference in degree. Um, but, uh, yeah, but sorry, uh, what I was just going to say is there are ways um, to deal with these issues. I mean, the ILO, exists to come up with conventions. The International Labor Organization, that's, that's its raison d'etre. Um, there is a migrant workers convention. You know, there are very specifically tailored human rights standards that could be applied in these situations. And I mean, the ironic thing is that in many cases, the money is not going to be lost in the country where the architecture is getting built. Um, the money is going to these middleman uh, labor supply agencies um, who are just sitting on it back in Bangladesh or India or whatever. They don't, often they don't even have uh, branches operating legally in places like Saudi Arabia or uh, the United Arab Emirates, right? So what really needs to happen is to eliminate the middleman, which is actually the law in many of these um, countries that receive uh, labor in, in the region. Um, and it's, it's a question of political will, um, and, it's a qu and it's also a problem on the part of the labor sending country that they may not have the capacity, these are developing countries that may not have the capacity to rigorously monitor these you know, very dirty agencies that are exploiting people. And they may not also have the desire to do so because they don't want to mess up their remittances, which are an incredibly important part of the economy. I mean, if you start making a lot of problems, there could be a race to the bottom and you know, Saudi Arabia no longer goes to Bangladesh, it starts going to another country. Um, so there's a lack of vigorous enforcement of workers' rights on both sides of this equation. Um, but, you know, there are, there, are thing, there are tools in place that could be, that could be deployed. Um, and so could the private actors involved. There could be contractual provisions that are enforceable. Again, as Andrew said, the most important thing is to make this stuff enforceable. Uh, where if workers are getting screwed over, then you can terminate the subcontractor who is doing it. Um, you know, and, and actually apply penalties. I wonder yeah. if there's a way, however, of um, building a bridge between, <clears throat> you know, the condition, the precarious conditions, and and some people talk about indenture uh, when it comes to uh, student debt among, you know, apprentice professionals in the sweatshop type conditions in a lot of the major architectural firms. That's the kind of rhetoric that gets bandied around, and I know that some people take exception to drawing comparisons between, you know, high wage trainee professionals in rich countries like this one and, and migrant workers who really are indentured in, uh, in the authoritarian states that we are, that we're discussing right now. Um, <clears throat> but I actually find the, 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 the rhetoric very useful in a way. I mean, anything that, um, anything that could induce uh, highly trained, highly educated uh, uh, folks to identify in any way, to generate any kind of fellow feeling for, uh, for people who are at the very bottom of the labor chain in, in, in poor countries is, is very useful and is something that has to be built upon. The fact that there is some kind of bridge there, or there could be a bridge there, uh, is a uh, is the beginning of, um, of the kind of networks of solidarity that perhaps we could be discussing this evening. It is a little too much, obviously, to expect, um, you know, star architects to be involved. I mean, they have too much at stake in ignoring or being in denial about the, the chain of accountability. Um, but nonetheless, there are ways of targeting those names in the same way as in our campaigns, we've targeted the brand names of 
cultural and educational institutions. Uh, it remains the case, and, and, I, and I would add the cultural and educational institutions to, to that list of professionals that we were talking about earlier for whom uh, it has not been historically the case that they, that they see themselves as accountable to, uh, to these kinds of networks of labor conditions, but increasingly they are, especially if they want to be operating, and I'm talking about Western institutions here, if they want to be operating in authoritarian states overseas, that they do, um, they can't sell themselves too cheaply or their brand will suffer. Uh, because it becomes too obvious that they have been, they have, they, they've, been, they've sold their brands off in a sense, and they have absolutely no power over the conditions under which they operate in these countries, and they're simply a franchise. They've sold their, the name as a franchise. Whoever is paying the bills has um, uh, has uh, has a monopoly on on the decision making. Um, so, two things just to reiterate: I I do think there is. We have to think about ways of targeting the top brand names in the field uh, in the same way as, uh, as labor campaigns have, have sought to sully or tarnish the names of global firms and global brands. And also this other idea about making a, making a bridge between the conditions of precarity in, in the professions here and, and the even more precarious conditions of migrant workers over there. It certainly brings up the question about who, who's going to do that targeting of, of those star attacks, who's, um, uh, you know, who could be called to task here. Um, I, I'll just relay um, a recent kind of panel discussion at, at Yale with Frank Gehry and um, Paul Goldberger were, were talking, when, um, you know, about fame and glory. And um, one of the students asked um, the question about star architecture. What, what is your reaction to this word that's you know, being bandied around, star architect? And, and Frank Gehry's reaction was, people who talk badly about star architecture don't like architecture. It has taken so long for architects to actually have name recognition oh, yes. in culture that to argue against that hurts the whole profession, i.e., you need, you need the this architect, you need the brand in order to bring architecture to the cultural table and, and, and matter. And he was, he was very in, indignant ab about the fact that there's anything wrong with being yeah. a star architect, um, which then uh, uh, makes one think that if, if you know, it, those people are thinking that there is um, not just a, an egocentric um, advance that they make for their own particular firm, whatever that is, but that this is the cause for architecture. Um, who's, who's going to fight against that? And, this, and I'll just say then there was also a discussion with Michael Kimmelman who came in and all the discussion about why his social project now is also anti-architecture. Um, that, that was another discussion that went on. So there's this notion of architecture as an abstraction that, um, you know, kind of the, the more um, uh, uh, glorious it seems, um, the better it is for all of us who will then be the hangers-on to get to work for those people. So mm -hmm. it makes me think, who's, who's going to say to the Frank Gehrys, you know what, <laughs> um, you're, you're not helping yourself by being associated with these projects because everyone, the AIA wants it, apparently culture wants it, and all the, all the people who are coming out of school want to work for him. So who's, who's going to do it? Yeah. Well, you know, one, I'm thinking also of ways of connecting some dots here, uh, but, um, you know, it seems to me uh, to, uh, you know, that, that that might be a bit of a distraction to start, it's such a terrible <laughs> word, I can't, I have to say I can't use that word, it doesn't make sense to me, but, but, but let's say that the narcissist to, your, to whom you're referring are drawing us into their own into their narcissism by simply compelling us to speak about them even here today. I mean, it's just extraordinary how often this happens. Like, you know, that's why those kind of panels are set up so that we will then discuss them. And and so one one thing we could do together is, is in a sense refuse to talk about it. <laughs> uh, honestly, I, I mean this kind of literally. That that's enough. I mean, please. And okay, but but that part two of the suggestion. I wonder what you think about this. Uh, but because okay. If is to talk to speak to the what this other group of architects 
uh, they're usually called corporate architects, or or um, they're not the brand name architects, but they're, they're to some extent they have. I, I think generally we could say today because of this phenomenon, there's a kind of uh, ambivalence um, with respect to their status. On the one hand, they are the ones running the show. Not, Frank Gehry's not running the show. Like the SOMs of the world are running the show, uh, but at the same time, they're not getting credit for it anymore. And so. It seems to me that that there's a, there's a there's a there's a kind of identity crisis available there to leverage, um, and and okay. So here's my question because I'm trying also uh, I would like to try to ad lib if the organizers don't mind, and and interject another question uh, into this about the labor that's actually done in these offices, the, the, the labor itself that we're we're t we're discussing, and believe it or not, this is an effort to connect to Bill's uh, labor um, because actually. Um, what, what one could say that, that these various layers of architect that we're referring to uh, ha have, have, have done, have, have participated in over the last, like, say, 30 years, is a redistribution uh, of, of risk, essentially, uh, which is where the unionization questions come in, where the cost uh, and, and contractual uh, questions come in. Uh, where the I didn't do it, you know, I mean, in a sense, if the other f answer by those unnamed architects who like to hear themselves discussed is that, you know, I didn't do it, wasn't me. I think you said that. Like, you know, who builds your architecture? I don't know. Um, but what you actually do do is produce documents, produce usually in any given office, especially in these big corporate ones, several types of documents that are really technical instruments. F they're material kind of devices for the redistribution of risk. They range from contracts, construction contracts, legal contracts, various kinds, to the drawings themselves that are, you know, that's why Freddie's beautiful example of the rendering that in a sense had contractual implication and had, had sort of proto-legal consequences. Um, and and this, is, this is what, so you know, because the simple, the, the, the one and only answer we maybe can agree on vis-a-vis -vis the who builds your architect is it's definitely not architects who build those buildings. Uh, the definition of the architect is somebody who doesn't build. Uh, the architect makes drawings, writes contracts, makes documents, is trained to do all these other things. So, so it seems to me if one redefines the labor of the architect as, as the one who makes, the, produces these documents that can be kind of lined up next to the Human Rights Watch reports and kind of to produce, a, as it were, discursive solidarities and, and kind of, let's say, uh, toolkits. Um, that, uh, you know, to, to, to leverage this. Okay, so that doesn't answer your question, but in a sense tries to repose it in a certain way more concretely with respect to the labor that's actually, you know, the question then being, is there, is there some kind of leverage inside the, the office, so to speak, um, not at the top necessarily, but in the, in the production process itself that opens onto, um, onto these questions, right? You see the, you see the, No, anybody? I'm, I'm, I guess this is more for the for, for Freddie and, and Peggy. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not sure how to respond to that. I would rather go back one step, okay. if you don't mind. Um, and I think it's important in, in regard to the education of architecture and uh, its understanding of somewhat the aim of the, the profession is really to be fully aware of new technology. Uh, I think this globalization, and again, it's a complex word, but uh, it's possible because we have the possibility to be in communication, in contact, maybe very superficially, but somewhat in contact with some developer in Dubai or in Shenzhen or in whatever. And um, on the so 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 we have this kind of dislocation from the context. We uh, don't necessarily are able to understand what's really happening, and therefore we end up designing object, as Peggy was saying. But on the other hand, as, as Andrew was mentioning, uh, because there's more and more of this uh, value of the architecture as being an object, as existing in, uh, as an image, more than an experience. People now are consuming architecture as a brand, as an image, much more than as space. Uh, we see numerous number of magazine, of TV and so on, where where it's uh, the image that start to have a value rather than being there. And um, therefore, I, I think we really need to be aware of those new tools and we can therefore criticize the image. We can uh, leverage this power of um, 
you know, this fairly superficial uh, condition that is very fragile. As Andrew was mentioning, I think the ability to organize and to, um, to, to uh, destabilize some of those brands uh, through new technology, uh, if the Egyptian can redistribute power, and maybe we should see what's happening next door, I don't know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, to me it's amazing to see uh, I was in Tahir Square like a, a month ago or so, but it, architecturally, physically, it's a very simple space. I mean, it's a roundabout. It's not anything specific in terms of physicality. But the redistribution of power of information, distribution of information, organization is, has been tremendous. Um, and I think it can, it can happen anywhere. It does happen here, and I think it can happen within the profession. And I think um, it's important in that sense to, to make people aware of, of the complexity of what we are working on, uh, not just on the superficial image, but also well, responding that we can uh, attack those images, we can criticize those images, we can destabilize those, those brand. Uh, not, it's not so difficult. Yeah. But, okay, okay. Um, well, I, I just wanted to, to go back to the star architects just one last time, because I think we are talking about them in a different way on this panel than is normally talked about. Um, and I, I just want to cite the, the, the example, wonderful sacrificial example in many ways, of the artists on the Gulf Labor Coalition, many of the regional artists especially, whose work was on the verge of being acquired uh, by the Guggenheim Abu mm. Dhabi and for sums of money mm. that were unheard of in their careers. And they, um, they showed an extraordinary, I mean, it was an extraordinary act, not of, of sacrifice, but of solidarity. They said, well, we, we're going to boycott this. We're going to refuse to be bought by the museum, in effect. And, and, and in terms of their livelihood, this was a huge sacrifice given how much money was involved. Um, so he, here's an example of our, you know, artisanal, um, you know, relatively freestanding, relatively entrepreneurial professionals uh, who do exist in a circuit, uh, but who do also have a, a history of, uh, of professional self-reliance who, who, who said no. Um, we, uh, we, 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 ha we are in the position of becoming regional stars, but we would rather, you know, not mm -hmm. like Bartleby, but we would prefer not to, <laughs> in some sense. Uh, so that, I think that's a wonderful example, and it, there is a parallel there, and there's, there's, there are differences, of course, in the architectural profession, but there, there are similar histories there that, that at least run parallel. With the corporate architect, with the corporate model you were, you were citing, Reinhold, I think you're much more in, in the structurally similar position of the Apple engineer in mm -hmm. that respect. Right. Um, and being in, being in, uh, in, in, in a sort of corporate chain where, of course, uh, you're not even in the position of being able to say, I, you know, I only design these things, I don't build them. Or, I mean, like the nuclear right. physicist during the Cold War right, who right. would say, I only design these things, I right. don't build the bombs or drop them. Yeah. Um, uh, so there was a kind of structural Right. plausible deniability that was built into it. Um, yeah. Well, it just seemed to me that there's some there's potential leverage there side by side with mm -hmm. the with the stars. But uh, I mean, do we have any Bartleby's in the audience? I, I I have to say that this, you know, having tested this this kind of a question in in other contexts, it's um, the question of who the I would be who prefers not to in the case of the, you know. Complexity of the architectural office, uh, Peggy. Maybe. Well, has. can I be the first to? I mean, but you, you yeah, I know they're, they're not, starting just, to be hands here, um, so we're going to do that. Um, yeah. When I pose that question, who who's actually going to resist um, this this thing? Um, I actually think it's going to happen from the bottom. Yeah, I would bottom think up, so not too. from not from the top right. down. It's not going to be yeah. the AIA. It's not going to be the it's the, the students. The, it's it's going to be students. Yeah, yeah. It is going to be students. So. Let's just hope that you all agree, and we want to hear from the students. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. This, uh, speaking of who? Andy. Reading 
against the market. Yeah. So, um, yeah, um, so I already said my question. Did everybody hear? <laughs> <laughs> I just wondered if anybody knew anything about that or had any thoughts about, you know, the just the sort of inherent restrictions that we face. I mean, coming from somebody who works in a corporate office yeah. and who occupies, the, I would have to say, a lower tier of that office, <laughs> um, you know, it's really difficult to see where your, where your power is in that structure, especially when you're also saddled with six figures of debt. So, um, you know, it's also, you know, that, that extra juridical layer on top which could potentially, you know, make you lose your job or, you know, you know, have you disbanded from any sort of professional association at some point in the future, you know, just piles it on even further. And it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult environment which you guys have brought up, which is very interesting, uh, or I appreciate that you guys brought it up, but yeah, it's, a, it's complex. So, just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> Anybody? Where are we going here? You wanna? Yeah. It's just La louder, louder. It's is it on? It, it is on. Yeah. Okay. I don't have an answer to that, but I, I wanted to say, I mean, in terms of Andrew's point that the architect is a little bit like the engineer at Apple, I think the narcissist types that we're trying not to talk about, they would have a lot more say than an engineer at Apple if they decided that this was an important issue. Sure. They would definitely, sure. you know, they could, you know, yeah. influence yeah. Um, the um, clients or the, you know, or the public. Um, so in that sense, they're not really as um, inconsequential as the, you know, an ab ab sort of part of a corporate machine. And they could use their, you know, image and narcissism to a, you know, sure. positive kind of, um, you know, way. Um, and also I just wanted to add that I agree with Peggy that it will, it will come from the students, it will come from the younger generation. I mean, they're going to be the ones. But also it's a whole kind of, in a way, in Reinhold, Reinhold's terms, a kind of education complex, right? Because, you know, I mean, the schools that employ, um, you know, the people we don't want to talk about, they need to employ other people too, you know, who do human rights work or, you know, engage in buildings in a completely different way. Um, and so, you know, it's the critics, it's the historians, it's the people who publish who have to become more proactive. And so this whole thing shouldn't just fall on an, on an architect. You know, it's, yeah. it's, yeah, yeah. it's, it's great that we're having this discussion. I'm, I'm really happy. And, I need, and also, one last thing. <laughs> when I was teaching at Columbia a few years ago and I gave my students, we were looking at Dubai, um, an article by Mike Davis that, that, you know, that talks exactly about this. And then I would ask them, so given all of this, would you guys still go there and build? I was so amazed because most of them, like maybe all of them would say yes, yeah. we would still go there and build because that's what really interested them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so yes, because they are taught that architecture is an expressive field. Yeah. It's not a, a, a practice, it's, it's, a, it's an art form that has no strings attached of the sort that uh, the Guggenheim, I think, similarly um, suggested. But you know, um, the, I was gonna say vis-a-vis -vis that, that example at least, um, that uh, the other thing, I, I agree, you know, and, and to take some responsibility for this, uh, would, would mean um, to, that we probably also find, ought to find a way to, in a sense, stop saying that the architect has no traction here, mm -hmm. uh, whoever, or the, the various participants in this, because that's one of the narratives that these, these particular students that, that you're referring, again and again, I w you know, if I could, I would, but I can't, so I, you know, what can I do? I can't do anything, and that's, it's a, that sensibility that, you know, that, that produces this sort of, well, yes, I would like to be a good citizen, but in the end, I can't anyway, so I might as well just go do it, right? So, th that, yeah. Right, right, that's the first step, but I think the first step is also, that, 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 that together with that is the, the point that, that, in fact, um, there is traction at a variety of levels of the sort that's being discussed and you know many other levels and and in a sense we we need to learn to to teach ourselves not to teach uh the absence of agency you know which which mm -hmm. is another one of these performances that you get again and again and again 
in you know well-meaning uh, cultural settings where I, you know I'd like to help but nothing I can so anyway but I will shut up yeah, I like I'm happy that this conversation <clears throat> is happening and that uh, it's I hope it's only a beginning um, it's like I like the multidisciplinary aspect of it I like uh, it, it seems that we're close to each other in different communities but we're far apart also and um, I'm thinking about um, Frank Gehry's latest whatever you want to call it you know masterpiece or work yeah. uh, 80 Spruce Street you know it's New York by Gary all right New York by Gary all right all right, all right. Uh, built on top of a school yes. but they wanted to make sure that God forbid the people who are can afford to live here have to encounter right. the mostly poor inner city kids so they made sure that the entrance to the school was all the way on the other side so it's like we're so close but we're far away um, and this whole idea of border crossing, I'm a teacher, I'm an English professor, but I can't make a living as an English professor, so I recently got a real estate license. Oh. So now I'm writing about <laughs> architecture. That's my okay. way of sort of border crossing <laughs> my way into my new field. So I published essays about HL23 and about the Blue Building, oh, but yeah. Bernard Chumi's yeah. Blue Building. Yeah. And when I wrote about these buildings, I made sure I wanted to have some connection with the community as I was writing the pieces, so I actually walked around and talked to strangers as I was writing them. And the Blue Building, as an example, there was a variety of responses, you know. But two people, very interestingly, said to me, I don't know anybody in that building. And one person actually said, I wish I did know somebody in that building. Now, you could examine and dissect that remark in many different ways, but it shows you a kind of alienation that the communities aren't, you know, talking to each other. And I think this conversation could also become more inclusive as well. And the final thing about art, architecture as art, and the people, do the people building these buildings even know anything about that? You know, like, do they know, could they talk about it intelligently? Could they have an interpretation? Shouldn't there be schools? And that goes into, you know, the question of where people were being overworked. Nobody has time to do that, you know, so if we had a shorter work week. So all these political questions can be addressed. But the fact that we're having these co this conversation is incredible, and it I think it just should continue. Thanks. And continue it will with somebody else, I'm sure. Yeah, OK. Yeah, it, it's funny that the blue building, the client was actually the contractor. So the people who built that building actually made a lot of money building it. But um, the, I, I guess I, I really appreciate this conversation on many levels. And, and I, I especially appreciate that the, um, the quote is a quote from architectural criticism. And so I guess I wanted to talk about the extent to which this, um, the question of who built architecture sort of sublimated within the field of criticism itself, which I'm glad was kind of already brought up. Um, but sort of related to that, I guess I wanted to go back to, um, to the UAE, but in a different way from Sadiat Island and sort of what some of what Fred was presenting. Um, the, the, I just wanted to hear about the, the sort of equivalency between these sites as sort of physical sites of construction, but also sites of research in a kind of speculative way and the extent to which the possibility of these sites becoming the sites of a kind of imagination, um, you know, operates critically, right? So, research. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting that Dubai, maybe even more uh, specifically than Abu Dhabi, but it's referred as this uh, architectural playground and uh, this incredible opportunity where people can do research, but ultimately what is being built is quite boring and quite clear where the playground is for the developer to maximize money maybe more than to dream any new type of society um, which is which is really uh, a shame on the other hand um, we should also accept that uh, even so there's a grand plan by uh, Sheikh Mohammed and, and his family etc or his uh, clan, um, a lot of people are happy to play that game. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the strange thing is that uh, all those buildings are pre-sold. People want to invest money in there. Uh, and the one that are pre-sold are the one who have the best image, not necessarily the best space. Uh, so, so I think it's, it's easy to uh, criticize all those uh, 
new development and new new city. I mean, literally, um, Dubai has been multiplied by, you know, something like from from it's been like fifty thousand people to now potentially. 10 million people if we talk about the people coming on a transient level. But, uh, but to open our eyes and to look at it as some degree of, of reality, some degree of collective dream that people have been thinking was an ideal thing and to, to be very critical of it, but also to, to understand that it's kind of a materialization of our society. It's a materialization of some kind of dream that maybe has been pre-sold to people, but that also has been uh, played with. Um, and, and all those notion of you know, are you, are you really on a beach if the beach is artificially constructed? And are you really next to the ocean if your ocean is only 20 meter wide and fish are rotting in it? I mean, is the image of the ocean and the beach enough or do you actually need to have waves? Uh, same with the image of a community or do you need a community? And uh, I think it's, it has been a playground, there's no doubt, um, for architects, for developers, for people who are imagining possible capitalist development. And, and I, I think we can learn from it. Just as there were those books about learning from Las Vegas, I think we need to be uh, aware that we need to learn from Dubai, uh, from Abu Dhabi, uh, not glorifying it by any means, uh, but to be aware that a lot of people think that this is somewhat of a you know, glossy dream, but it's, uh, it's, it's also quite a horrendous place sometimes. So um, I, I think it's, it's our role as, as academic and critic to, to look at the present condition um, and to understand all the complexity, including the human right abuse, including the economical uh, failure, et cetera. But mm -hmm. it's, uh, I think if you really, really wanted to freak out the authorities in Abu Dhabi, you would imagine an architecture that would allow the migrant workers to be permanently based there and to live there for the rest of their lives and to learn how to appreciate <laughs> these cultural institutions and visit them frequently. <laughs> I, I, I have one story about research, though, that relates to, uh, to NYU Abu Dhabi, because the, the government part of the, the contract for NYU Abu Dhabi involves a vast, um, a vast amount of money, I think it's $100 million a year, which is for research, um, and it's, it's for faculty basically within NYU to tap into. The only stipulation is that it's, you know, it's research about the region, it's research about the United Arab Emirates. And it's quite patently a way for the government to buy itself a place on the research map of the world. That research wouldn't be done otherwise. Um, and it's, 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 very, it's, it's a very crude and, 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 and blunt way of purchasing research about your country and winning yourself a place on, on the global research map. Um, and as you can well imagine, there's all sorts of kinds of, there's all sorts of research proposals that would not, uh, that would not win grants under that rubric. Um, certainly any, any research into migrant labor conditions would, um, you know, would not be <laughs> successful in the competition for funding. And I, I remember earlier on, we, we, did, we, we did make a proposal to, um, to the administration about doing a conference in offshore universities, and, um, uh, which would have been a wonderful thing to do. And I don't mean to discount that a lot of the academic professionals and artists who've been involved in those campaigns uh, w were also motivated by the prospect of a really sort of dynamic cultural presence in the region and, and, and wanted Sadiat Island to be a dynamic place rather than an offshore cultural free trade zone that is sort of heavily uh, circumscribed in terms of its activities, its curriculum in, at NYU and also in terms of the exhibitions and, and the other uh, educational offerings at the museum. Um, but it, it, the evidence so far is it's not shaping up that way um, and that it is very heavily circumscribed environment. Um, so, but the research part of it is certainly there and there is research being generated, um, but it's not necessarily the research we would want to be doing. <laughs> I think there was um, I was uh, 
uh, when I looked at the uh, li list of the panelists, I was amazed with diversity, sociologists, historians, architects, and I thought it would be more important to discuss how architecture is produced, because architects uh, in the process of production of buildings and shaping the city are really uh, impotent actors in a lot of respect. And I think, because we touched on uh, both locally and globally, uh, this, this is a global and a local problem. I can give many examples. I would say, first of all, World Trade Center uh, and uh, Liberty Tower and the whole planning and uh, the, the way it was done, the way it was executed. I think architects don't really have influential role and unfortunately also architectural institutions don't represent interest of citizens or profession itself. And um, in a way, um, I, I don't think star architects are really that important in the process of shaping the city. Uh, you need to have a lot of star architects in order to change a city. I think it's far more important the way uh, institutions, committees work and the way the buildings are built. Uh, there are many uh, uh, government agencies that build in this city, like School Construction Authority, um, and they produce enormous amount of spaces, buildings, that architects really don't have much influence, especially good architects or even you know, people at schools. A long time ago, I worked with the SCA and the HHC, so I know what you're t talking about, but I think Peggy might have something to say about this. Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, what, what I hear is um, both the, that the owner of, of the building has more influence or the, the, the agencies that um, have the ability to decide um, how the owners are then going to select their architects and, and do this other thing, which I think is a, is a really good point. Um, but I do think that there is a trend, and this, this may not speak to your question, but it will go back to something that was in question number four or whatever, where the distance between the, um, the people who produce buildings and design buildings is getting bigger and bigger. The general discourse is that that's not the case, you know, that that is one of the right. things that comes with, with IPD right. and, right. and with, with BIM is, is that there really is a shared um, set of knowledges and everyone actually shares in the design of, of a thing. So that actually brings not just the fabricators and the engineers and the contractors, the subs to the architects, but also brings the owners and, and the architects closer together. If one takes that to a logical conclusion, that basically means that the contracts will no longer be between the architect and the owner and the architect and the contractor, which puts all of those in antagonistic positions, but that you actually um, set up um, uh, uh, special limited um, uh, liability contracts so that you actually share the risks, share the um, um, the rewards, um, and and um, and then in that way, all of you are are really acting as your own agents in that way. So I'm I'm just saying I think you're right, but but then the question is how is it that the architects cannot be peripheral or side watchers to that, but actually then begin to be some people who are considered with within that same distribution of of money, wealth, risk, labor, all those other things. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, the question here. Yeah, just um, maybe back to Bill's uh, comment about the migrant workers and a clarification to Fred's earlier comment about you know the conditions in Switzerland where, yes, uh, there is insurance perhaps in some of those things in place, but for many, many years, uh, most of construction in Switzerland was done uh, by migrant workers who were not allowed to live in the country. Uh, they were given seasonal passes. Their families were not allowed. Uh, to immigrate and become citizens. So even there, I think not all is as well. So I think it's important to remember that, you know, also in this country, as in Switzerland, where we think many things have been achieved, uh, we should not forget it's always entry-level jobs like construction workers uh, or, you know, students that get hired by professors such as myself uh, or uh, that really is is one of the big questions there, right? What do you do with uh, people seeking better opportunities elsewhere? And how do we start addressing this where these people have uh, the opportunities in their own countries? And perhaps that's not the role of the architect, but uh, what I'm getting at, having sort of 
work that I think in all of these things have been discussed. As a construction worker in Switzerland, a teacher here at New School, uh, owner of a, fa of a company here, I think in the end, we, every day we make uh, decisions, small decisions, and uh, we do have impact, I think, uh, in this. And lastly, to Peggy's point, uh, 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 on a legal matter there too, we still are writing uh, uh, specifications uh, which are part of the legal contracts where we make choices as architects where we can begin, I think, to influence how those specifications are written and who, in the end, will be able to fulfill those. So I think there, too, we have agencies. And I think uh, I'm also happy to say that students today are much more aware of, of all of those possibilities and are not just trained by star architects or made to live up to those uh, as I was when I was trained as an architect. So uh, we have a couple more uh, questions uh, coming up, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. But first, I did want to see if anybody had any responses. I mean, that, I mean yeah. quickly, uh, thank you for correcting me in, in a way. Um, maybe to go back to, I mean, Switzerland had the, the, this notion of permis or C permit for temporary worker or migrant worker and so on. But, and, and, and definitely, even if Switzerland has quite a social system inside its, for its own citizen, it's an extremely uh, uh, capitalistic uh, internationally through its bank or even quite racist to, to the rest of the world. Um, but I, I think the notion of protocol, even as problematic as those permits were, uh, they were clearly uh, visible for everybody to be uh, quite surprised and annoyed by those by those system, but at least they were legal system. Uh, uh, I think the notion of illegal immigrant in this country, uh, I mean, I have been doing some construction where you know that half of your people who are on the small construction site are Chinese who can't speak any English or are Mexican who can't speak any uh, English either. And, and it's difficult, you know, what do you do? And uh, so I, I think the idea of, of asking for, for at least protocols, which again, quite rightly, were, were highly criticized in Switzerland, uh, but, but were existent to be criticized, to be uh, negotiated, to be transformed, uh, I, I think is an important first step. Um, yeah, um, first just want to thank all of you for an amazing panel. Uh, and as well as the organizers. I can't believe it's like 8.37 right now. I feel, <laughs> I feel like I just started, so it's great. But um, just a point of information. Um, for those who don't know it, the Harry Van Arsdale Center for Labor Studies, um, which is part of the Empire State College, actually offers courses to members of the trades uh, who are part of the union, trades unions. And in fact, they're required to take courses as part of union membership. And in fact, um, right now we have a, at where I teach at Queens College, uh, Greg Shillette and I are starting a pilot program in social practice and we have a student who teaches at Harry Van Arsdale and she's teaching a course in public art to uh, these uh, members of the trades unions. So just to speak to your question and also to the whole question of education, that maybe there are some ways that you can, you know, start making contacts at least with, you know, local workers and, you know, which of course is, is a whole other part of this question of, um, you know, the, as Reinhold was saying about how you know, people are tr always trying to get around the requirements to use union workers, so this becomes problematic as well. It creates a kind of resistance to helping migrant workers or having any sympathy for migrant workers, you know, where, where unions actually exist. Uh, so anyway, just point of information. So we, oh, thank you, Maureen. Yeah. So we, we give the last word to one of the organizers, Katam Bakshi. So. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, just, I had a question. Um, Last question. But then. I guess I, I was also supposed to give the <laughs> closing remarks, so maybe we can. I can just do both at the same time. Or actually, I would like a response, so maybe I'll wait a little bit. But I had a question about um, uh, what Peggy was describing: the new kind of models of practice with BIMs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, where, uh, in this context, it's true that the 
act of making things and designing things is possibly coming together with all the new technologies and fabrication on the one hand. Um, but when that same um, kind of set of um, people or let's say design architects, if maybe we don't use star architects, uh, when the context shifts to other countries, and especially maybe South Asia in this example, there's a celebration of kind of handmade um, idea of making things. And there is this sort of idea that, you know, that construction sites where you hear hammers, et cetera, hand, you know, those are kind of interesting. And isn't it that the handmade somehow becomes more important and, and takes over? So I'm just wondering about that shift, which I see with students too, the kind of culture of handmade and machine made. You know, on the one hand, they want to do machine made here, but they want to celebrate the handmade in the other context and, and not address how that handmade happens, et cetera. Um, so I guess my question is, you know, about that, that shift, is it just, just the context that, that produces that, or is there a kind of a mismatch? I mean, it's obvious to me that, you know, you can have power tools in other countries too, where, you know, it doesn't have to be handmade, et cetera. So I'm not sure if it's a... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I can answer that, except to say that um, BIM um, doesn't necessarily entail digital fabrication. It, 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 it just brings the, all the people who are going to be involved in the design of it um, to, to the virtual Same model. So, we, so people who are at the back end come to the front end, but the people at the back end, you know, which are the fabricators, or we could actually say the people in the, we, there's a disconnect between the fabricators and the people who are actually in the factory floor. And then I think this whole conversation has really made me aware that when we say um, very easily, oh yeah, the fabricators are usually the back end come to the front, but kind of like the guys who are actually in the factory, <laughs> not just who are leading that is another thing. But putting that aside, the, the people at the back end are, you know, come to the front end, and those don't necessarily need to be non-hand um, uh, people. That, that doesn't necessarily come with machine fabrication. It, it just means that they get in on, on this. Um, but what I meant was so that that's bringing the whole, um, all the players together, this yeah. whole process, not necessarily yeah. hand versus machine, but maybe the question I didn't frame. But in other contexts, you know, these kind of technologies are used for designing, but that part is lost about, you know, in other contexts, the, the distance is actually going further and further in terms of what, you know, so somehow that transfer or that knowledge that we are acquiring here, let's yeah. say, is, is not, you know, getting transferred to other places. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I can answer you because I, because I think I know what you mean, except that I do think that, that in some way they both they both foster a do-it-yourself system, or, or that, that in some in some way, BIM is most powerful for making. I th I think small offices operate like big offices because because you actually don't need to have the staff that you used to have once upon a time. And so there's a there's a certain sense of empowerment that comes with that that um, is not all that different. I th I think from the kind of um, empowerment that we're seeing from from Frederick's work, you know, where you can you you feel that you don't need that organization to produce the the thing. So I. I know that it's different, but I think they go together in a certain um, sense of, of, of empowerment that leaves behind the SOMs yeah, and the the whatever. So. Do you want to say that? Sorry. Um, okay, well, I just actually, I uh, wanted to <laughs> concretize. I, I remember being in this room a couple of years ago, I think, and we, uh, at an con architecture conference about South Asia, I believe, in which Todd Williams and Billy Chen thoroughly romanticized the construction site. <laughs> In, in Mumbai in which they were working, um, and not only that reproduced the gender violence of the construction site, precisely a, a place in which women uh, are expected to carry bricks on their head and raise children. Uh, outside of the world of BIM, I think this is kind of what kind of sort of alluding to, this sort of, you know, that the, the kind of, that virtue is constructed uh, in certain ways as a practice of stepping outside that I see. Abstraction in the direction of craft. 
rather than you know any uh, than 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 working through it, which is, sounds more like what you're suggesting. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I I I see what you're, yeah. you're saying. But Andrew had some uh, some thoughts, and then I'll cut him. I guess you'll have some further closing yes. comments, or Do Beth too. Okay. Well, they'll figure that out. Meanwhile, I I just wanted to say, and it's more of a closing comment. Mm -hmm. we, we've heard a lot of talk this evening about a lack of agency on the part of architects uh, in terms of their practice and their contractual positions, um, and so on and so forth. And I think uh, these are all very important. But I, I would just like to point out that. Um, uh, that's not the only subject position that architects inhabit. There can also be labor advocates in their own right. Uh, they can be architects and labor advocates. They can be architects and labor activists, and they can join these campaigns. Um, and they can use their professional capital uh, as labor advocates in ways that shouldn't necessarily compromise their professional activities. Uh, so I don't think it's an either or. Um, I mean, many professionals lend their names and, and, and their professional identities to activist causes, and it seems to me that's another way of thinking about this issue this evening, uh, rather than just you know targeting uh, the top brand architects or uh, or thinking about the corporate architects and what they can do within their own practice, but also encouraging architects to you know adopt another voice and wear another hat and use their professional capital to lend substance and support to, to these very important labor campaigns. For sure. For sure. And That's so we perfect. Yeah, so we have the <laughs> final word. Yeah, so I don't final word only, is forthcoming. Yeah, the only closing I would um, say that we do want to continue this conversation. And I think uh, what we would like to hear, and you can probably find us through the program, our names, that, so please email whatever suggestions you have. I think, as you mentioned, it's a multidisciplinary um, conversation. Uh, so. I think the conversations can take many different formats. They can, you know, also have online components or they don't have to be, they could be round tables. We, we did have, I would mention we did have um, some, uh, let's say, uh, difficulty in finding <laughs> yes. all sorts of different <laughs> types of architects, uh, you know, at different kind of offices that we were, I mean, part of it could just be scheduling, et cetera, but we want to continue this conversation. <laughs> and we wanted to thank um, Karen, especially for hosting the first, uh, what we hope will be um, the, uh, a longer series of the events and giving us an opportunity to, to give this, uh, to do this here. Thank you.